Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's, it's uh, a real pleasure to sort of reconnect with folks in AGS. Um, I think I mentioned to Dave a little while ago when he kindly invited me to give the talk. Um, it's been a little while since uh, I felt somewhat disconnected from AGS because I haven't really been doing a whole lot of research uh, through my job as a research scientist with uh, the GSC in the Atlantic region really over the last decade. But uh, I always describe the past work that we've done in Nova Scotia really as the project that never really goes away. And it's been really remarkable, especially in the last few years, just um, you know, how much has happened here in the province and, and uh, in other parts of the Atlantic region with respect to exploration of gold deposits and, and new development. And so what I'm gonna talk about this afternoon is sort of really an overview of um, the work that uh, we started back in Nova Scotia back in 2003 and uh, this was really a project that was active for roughly about a decade involving a whole bunch of different sort of other federal and provincial partners and various universities and so I want to kind of walk you through some of that research and then really uh, as Dave mentioned uh, talk a bit about what the how some of the lessons learned from these previous studies can be used today to help sort of uh, reduce environmental risks and manage wastes from new mining operations. So uh, the cover slide here really is I, I chose this deliberately just to give you an idea of the scale of some of the historical mining operations in Nova Scotia. This is a historical stamp mill way up on the eastern shore in Nova Scotia a few hours from Halifax uh, in a former district um, called the Dolliver Mountain uh, or Isaacs Harbor District and you know uh, mother nature has largely taken these places over I think even a lot of local residents aren't really all that particularly familiar with this history but you know these were substantial operations and uh, you know it's it's been quite remarkable to see you know how quickly uh, some of these places do kind of return to nature uh, following the operations so uh, my talk this afternoon, what I wanted to do was just kind of start out and give you an overview of the history of gold mining and milling in here in Nova Scotia. And this, this dates back all the way into the early 1860s. Um, there's really what I'll refer to as the historical period is really between the 1860s and 1940s. There's been sort of very spotty sort of exploration and development. Uh, since that time, really up until 2017, when the uh, Moose River gold mine op uh, opened up, and we'll talk quite a bit about that later in the talk. Uh, the second part will be like a quick overview, really, of some of the environmental studies that we've done here in Nova Scotia on the gold mines. And I'm just going to summarize a few kind of key results of these sort of 10 or 15 years worth of studies. Um, and I will talk a fair amount about sort of human health risk assessment and subsequent management actions. That's really something uh, that's really come to the fore in the last couple of years. And, and it's something which has occupied a lot of our time as researchers to try and communicate these scientific results to people that are involved in managing some of these sites. And so, and then the last part of the talk really is going to talk more specifically about uh, how we can use some of the results from these studies to, to really improve um, uh, the environmental management at current as well as future gold mining uh, operations. So this is a quick map just showing, uh, you know, it's a simplified geological map in Nova Scotia showing the location of the main gold deposits in Nova Scotia. And historically, uh, Nova Scotia, um, the, the gold was discovered actually, you, you'll see right in the center of the slide, this place, Moose Land. Uh, gold was discovered there in 1858. And after that time, there was a huge rush of sort of staking and exploration. And the province early on subdivided the gold districts in Nova Scotia into 64 formal districts that are sort of shown by all these yellow dots on the map. Um, you'll note that uh, almost all of them are located in the Maguma terrain, so sort of southwestern Nova Scotia, south of the Cobbridge Shedabucto Fault System that cuts Nova Scotia sort of into north and south. And there are a few small deposits up here in Cape Breton that I'm not going to talk about this afternoon, but the majority are, are associated with this olive colored unit here, this brown unit called the Maguma Supergroup. And so this is sort of a Cambria Ordovician uh, group uh, composed mostly of slate and quartzite. Um, the gold is associated with sort of both primary lithologies and they're, they're part of both what's called the Halifax group as well as the, uh, the uh, Goldenville group. 
And I've just highlighted a few of the key districts you're going to hear me talk about here this afternoon. So one is uh, literally just 20 minutes from my house here in Bedford, Montague Gold Mines that has occupied a huge amount of our time. Uh, Goldenville up on the Eastern Shore was historically the largest district in Nova Scotia. That's about three hour drive from Halifax. We've done an enormous amount of research up in the upper and lower Seal Harbor districts, uh, which are a little further east, a very, very large, um, sort of historically large tonnage operations for the time. And, and also Waverly, which is also close to Halifax, uh, where there was sort of some early recognition in the late 1970s of the potential human health risks uh, associated with these mines. So, there are three primary types of gold deposits in Nova Scotia, and uh, those that occur in the Maguma group. Uh, there have been some new deposits that have been recognized uh, in recent years, but the three main types uh, consist of high-grade quartz veins. And so some of these, you know, are, are up to 15 grams per ton gold. This is, the, they were the main focus of all the historical mining activity. And you can see on this photo on the right-hand side, you know, this is a, a large sort of quartz carbonate vein and sort of offshoots out here to the right. Um, this is situated in, in uh, both sort of slate and quartzite in this particular district. And that's really what the historical miners were after, was these very high grade veins that were exposed uh, quite often near the surface. Um, at some point or another, people started to also recognize that we had low grade disseminated uh, gold deposits here in the Maguma terrain. And so these were lower grades, so somewhere between half a gram and four grams per ton gold. Uh, the most recent uh, Tupoi mine up in Moose River is I think running roughly about one and a half grams per ton uh, on average in some of their operations these days. But um, historically, these weren't a big focus of exploration, although there was some small scale development in the Cochrane Hill district district, uh, and certainly it's, it's the main focus of most uh, mining today. Um, the reason that Nova Scotia is still very prospective uh, for gold production is that most of this historical production happened within 200 meters of the surface uh, through various sort of types of underground shafts and drifts and such. And they really, again, focused on this high grade material only. So we know that the gold certainly extends deeper and uh, there was very little focus again on the disseminated gold. Vein mineralogy is really uh, consists primarily of quartz and carbonate and uh, iron sulfides are an important part of uh, the geology in these places. So that includes arsenopyrite, puritite and pyrite and a whole variety of different sort of accessory phases which host various metals. Um, from an environmental standpoint, uh, arsenopyrite really is an important uh, constituent to these deposits. And you can see just sort of a couple of crystals here and a, and a piece of uh, uh, quartzite on the, on the left. Uh, this is the main host for arsenic in the ore and the surrounding wall rocks. And so it's important to note like the arsenic in these deposits is naturally occurring. It was quite often sometimes used as a pathfinder element by prospectors to locate gold. And uh, that's where the arsenic in the uh, subsequent mine wastes originates. So this, uh, this slide sort of just gives a real quick snapshot of the history of, of gold mining in Nova Scotia. And um, there's been essentially three historical and one more recent gold rushes in the provinces. So I mentioned that gold was discovered in Moose Land in 1858. Uh, this instituted, you can see on this graph on the right, the first gold rush in Nova Scotia in the 1860s. This happened certainly just with just about a decade after the California gold rush uh, that, that started in 1849. Uh, it's safe to say certainly around the world, people had gold fever, people were looking everywhere. And uh, you know, some of the early miners, you know, were, were uh, you know, thinking they could make it rich and that, you know, some of this when gold was discovered that they might be able to just go around and pick it up off the ground. And this activity tapered off fairly quickly after that initial period when people realized this was not uh, uh, easy to, to get at some of these hard rock uh, uh, coasted gold deposits. And then there was a second uh, gold rush that happened starting around the sort of mid 1890s and it lasted up into the very early 1900s, about 1903 or so. And this is this uh, second spike you see here on the graph. And this was uh, in part driven uh, by improvements in technology. Um, there was still sort of drilling and blasting and, and most of the gold was still recovered using uh, mercury amalgamation at the time. 
But cyanidation, the use of cyanide to extract gold that was hosted in other minerals such as arsenopyrite and other minerals that couldn't be easily uh, processed using mercury amalgamation, that this sort of brought a new level of technology to these operations. And so there's a big push there and, and really historically, the, I think the highest uh, gold production was actually in the year 1900 when there was about 34,000 troy ounces of gold produced that year. And then of course the World War I happened and things tailed right off after that. Uh, just before the second of uh, the Second World War, there was a third gold rush. So this was uh, from about 1932 to 42. And then really after that, that again tailed off during the Second World War. Then there was minor production at the Sterling Mine in Cape Breton, uh, some production in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s from the Cochrane Hill deposit. But I just updated this plot the other day to give you some sense, and I'm going to come back to this of the scale of the production from the recently reopened or the recently opened Tukoi mine up in Moose River that Atlantic Gold has opened, plus a little bit of minor production from the Dufferin deposit up on the eastern shore. But uh, you can see this, you know, these deposits in the last couple of years have produced close to 90,000 uh, ounces of, of gold. And so it gives you some sense. Their production in a given year is, is just even from that one deposit is about three times what the historical uh, production was from all the gold deposits in Nova Scotia. So very different scale. Um, during the historical period, there's about 3 million tons of rock that were crushed to produce this gold. So that's roughly equivalent to the, uh, the production of, that, that's roughly the volume of tailings that was produced. And the historical production was about 1.2 million ounces up until roughly the 1940s. So I wanted to just, for, for reference here, give you an idea of what, what these historical operations really look like. What you can see on the upper left was actually some underground mining uh, that was typical of the late 1800s. This photo was taken in 1897. It actually shows miners using sort of a hydraulic jack and, and uh, drill to uh, work a quartz vein in the 50 mile steam dist stream district. And they were actually operating by candlelight in this photo. So some of these, these operations certainly were quite rudimentary. Um, there was a little bit of open pit development in a couple of districts like Mount Uniac. This pit that's shown on the right hand side here, this was a photo taken in the Goldenville district again in 1897. And I've circled in red uh, just for scale some of the miners that were in there. And you can see it was a pretty sketchy uh, uh, health and safety uh, um, procedures that were in place at some of these historical districts. It's a real sort of jumble work of, of broken timbers and everything in that pit. More typically was the photo that was on the right. This is again, or the, this is on the left here, uh, prospecting shafts in the Goldenville district in 1897. And again, I've, I've actually circled a couple of miners as well as a couple of kids here, including a little girl in a, in a dress on the right hand side. And this is what you typically would have seen historically in most districts in Nova Scotia where uh, you would have individual shafts. So here's one, here's another, here's another, here's another that would have been lined up perpendicular uh, or sort of horizontally parallel, I guess, on, on a quartz vein. And uh, these were individual companies that would be doing mining from an individual shaft. And then they would kind of collect that ore up and bring it over to a stamp mill for processing. So the next photo was actually a photo that was taken up near Sheet Harbor in 1893 by a former colleague of mine at the GSC named E.R. Faribault. Um, Furbo did an amazing job between the late 1800s or sort of late 1880s to uh, the early 1920s and mapping a lot of the historical gold districts in Nova Scotia and really, uh, you know, did a remarkable job of documenting these in early photography using glass plates. And what you see in there here in this image in the back is what's called sort of a five stamp mill. And so this is a battery containing one, two, three, four, five stamps. The ore would have been sort of broken up by a, a, a jaw crusher, some sort of preliminary crusher fed in behind these stamps here. And mercury was added both to the actual stamp, the battery box here underneath the stamps, as, as well as on this big copper plate in the foreground, uh, where it basically formed an amalgam on the copper and the, 
the ore would have been crushed by these stamps and then water was used to wash the crushed ore over this mercury coated copper plate. There would have been a screen here in this support that's been removed for cleaning in the mill. And what's happening is that this fellow in the foreground, this guy here is actually scraping the amalgam off of the copper plate. Uh, the, the free gold would have dissolved in the mercury to form an amalgam that was caught on that copper plate. And, uh, and then what they did was they scraped that off, collected it in an amalgam plate, and then that would have been sent to a refinery where the mercury was boiled off to recover the sponge gold, which would have been further refined into gold bullion. Uh, anything that was left over after that process was washed down here and uh, you can see here they had uh, shaking tables that were suspended from the ceiling of the stamp mill. These moved back and forth in a motion like this and what they did was created a, a concentrate of arsenopyrite uh, which was collected and then sent to other small mills for processing using cyanide. And or in the early days they actually even shipped that all over the, all the way over to Wales for, for smelting. And then anything that was left over after the shaking tables went out into this wooden trough or launder, it's called a tailings launder, and that would have gone straight out to the tailings dump, which in many cases was wherever downhill happened to be at the time. So this next photograph was taken in the Mooseland Gold District in 1897. And what it shows is a stamp mill in the background that I've labeled here as Crusher and sort of the, here's the head frame over the shaft here and the tailings are coming out of the stamp mill running down here and directly out into the Tangier River at the time. And so unfortunately of course during this historical period up and certainly until the mid-1940s there really wasn't much in the way of any environmental regulations whatsoever. Um, if you're looking for tailings these days near historical mills it's almost guaranteed that wherever downhill was uh, is where the tailings were, and these were usually deposited directly into lakes, streams, wetlands, low-lying areas, and in several cases, directly into the ocean where these mills were located uh, along the coastline. So if you go uh, and visit Nova Scotia Gold Districts today, this is what you see. There's lots of interesting history in the woods. So here's some, some uh, old stamp pads from a mill, uh, steam powered boilers that were used to generate energy at some of these stamp mills, as well as the remnants of old stamp mill foundations here at Goldenville. There's also a lot of hazards that one needs to be very careful of. You know, the department, uh, Nova Scotia, former Department of Natural Resource, uh, and Mines and Energy these days has done a really good job actually of uh, signing a lot of these, uh, these sort of open shafts like this one that you see here and has put fences up in some districts close to uh, residential areas. And of course there's lots of tailings and this is what the tailings look like in the field. Um, unfortunately they also tend to be very very popular with the off-road sort of ATV and dirt bike crowd they're very easy to move around and make jumps like what you see here and so we see a lot of this activity uh, in the historical districts that brings people in uh, relatively frequent contact with these historical mine wastes so that's sort of the history part of the talk and uh, so the reason we started working on these districts back around 2003 was uh, um, we knew that between the 1860s and 1940s that a lot of mercury was used in these districts to recover gold and that the historical records suggested that up to 10 to 25 percent of that mercury was lost routinely to the surrounding environment and we knew also that uh, elements such as arsenic occurred naturally in these deposits and through crushing and, and such that they were present at high concentrations in the wastes. Uh, there was roughly 3 million tons of historical gold mine tailings that were deposited basically without any uh, controls up until the mid 1940s and really it only received limited study to this point you know there were some studies in the late sort of 70s and 80s uh, on a couple of the districts but one thing that continues to happen today, as you'll hear, is uh, that expanding residential developments and other recreational activities continue to bring people into contact with the mine wastes. Uh, the first evidence that this could be a problem occurred in 1976, when someone living in Waverly actually was diagnosed with chronic arsenic intoxication uh, when they showed up here at the hospital in Halifax. 
And the subsequent studies show that their well had actually been lined with tailings and waste rock from the historical gold district. And uh, as opposed to today's drinking water limit of 10 parts per million arsenic, this person's well at about 5,000 parts per billion or five milligrams per liter. And uh, uh, there was a subsequent study in the Waverly district that actually resulted in the, uh, uh, the local uh, municipality uh, providing the entire community out there actually with treated drinking water uh, and getting people in general off of the, off of their wells uh, to minimize any any further exposure to arsenic. So we had a few studies that that uh, to go on, but really a lot of unanswered questions about where these wastes were and really you know how widely distributed they were in the environment. So the main objective of these studies that, that uh, you know, were initiated by the GSC, but you know, really involved a very broad range of partners, uh, was initially really just to look at the concentrations and the distribution uh, of these various metalloids, not just in the mine waste, but in the soils and, and, and rocks and sediment, as well as vegetation near these gold mines to understand something about the distribution of these sort of essentially unmapped mine wastes, as well as the background concentrations of elements of concern like arsenic and mercury. So we could kind of get a sense of, you know, what these background levels look like and, and get, a, get an idea of, of where the levels were more elevated. Uh, we wanted to also understand the chemical and physical processes that control the release of elements and transported them to the environment. And uh, as you'll see, eventually we really got a lot more into looking at the bioavailability and biological impacts of the metalloids and routes for human exposure. And this, is, this has been a fairly major focus over the last decade of working with various partners to recommend uh, uh, strategies for, for reducing human and ecosystem health risks. So I'll give you a quick overview, and there's, I'm going to run through these slides reasonably quickly. I don't expect everyone to absorb them in uh, full detail here, but this I just wanted to give you a sense. This is a box and whisker plot showing arsenic concentrations in the tailings, just to give you an idea of how much arsenic is actually in these things. And so um, this, this plot basically shows these are parts per million arsenic concentrations on the y-axis here, and 14 different districts across the bottom sort of range from west to east. And what I wanted to highlight was just this number shown in yellow on the right hand side. So the mean concentration of arsenic in roughly 433 tailing samples we collected from these districts is about one weight percent or 10,000 part per million arsenic. Uh, the concentrations, as you can see, vary widely between districts. Um, but for reference, if you have these things close to where you live, the federal guideline for arsenic in soil is about 12 parts per million. And the reason it's that low is arsenic is not only toxic, but is potentially carcinogenic as well. Um, and so, you know, we've got several orders of magnitude higher in the mine wastes. And we also had done an early study uh, with the province looking at tills and soils in these districts and realized that the background concentration was already an order of magnitude higher even than the federal guideline. And actually we were seeing, you know, roughly about 100, 110 parts per million arsenic in the soils in a lot of these districts. And that was just pu through pure uh, sort of natural processes associated with the formation of these deposits and subsequent uh, uh, glacial activity. Uh, for comparison, this is the same type of plot that shows mercury concentrations in the tailings. Um, the concentration over here, uh, the mean concentration is about seven part per million. And one of the things I wanted to highlight here was that from a human health perspective, that concentration seven ppm, while still quite high, is fairly close and just slightly exceeds the National Soil Quality Guideline for, for mercury in soils. This is inorganic mercury. Um, and so it was not as much of a concern for people involved in human health risk assessment as was arsenic, which was you know, orders of magnitude higher than the federal guideline, um, but still very much a concern, especially for uh, fish and other things living in the ecosystem and that, and that's really something that has only really received a lot of attention just, just more recently. Um, the other thing is, is there's just really not that much mercury that, that exists naturally in these gold deposits. You know, the mean concentrations uh, of sort of a till and soil was more around 50, 55 per billion, so much, much less than what we were seeing in the tailings where the mercury was added as a part of the processing. 
So in addition to looking at total concentrations, a major component of our research was also understanding what minerals did the arsenic and mercury exist in and, and how did this impact sort of their, their mobility in the environment and ultimately their fate uh, downstream. So uh, a lot of this work was done uh, by former students uh, and especially co-supervised with uh, Dr. Heather Jameson, who I think is on the call here from Queen's University. And uh, uh, she and her students uh, they, uh, uh, did a really phenomenal job looking at uh, the sort of not just the primary mineralogy of these deposits, but also the secondary mineralogy. What happens when these things actually weather? And that's what I highlighted in this slide here. So I talked about arsenopyrite, and this is these are the tailings out of Montague. And what you see here is actually a pure layer of arsenopyrite in the upper left that was deposited uh, over top the tailings, uh, sort of as the last gasp of operations wrapped up there in the late 1930s. And subsequently, weathering over decades and decades has produced what's called a hard pan, which is basically cemented tailings uh, that are very, very high in arsenic, uh, but contain arsenic in a completely different mineralogical form. And so uh, Heather and her students, my colleague Jean Percival, I think is here on the call, and others have studied some of this in a fair amount of detail. And what you see in some areas is a lot of this mineral here in the middle uh, photograph called scoridite. It's a hydrated iron arsenate mineral that contains about 32 weight percent arsenic. And it has a very, very different solubility than does arsenopyrite showing up here with about 40 weight percent arsenic, 46 weight percent arsenic. A, a third type uh, that we see is arsenic bearing iron oxyhydroxides, where the iron is actually, the arsenic is actually uh, absorbed to the surfaces of iron oxyhydroxides. So there's a whole host of different secondary minerals that have formed purely through weathering reactions in these tailings since they were deposited going up into the 1940s. And these minerals have different solubilities and as you'll subsequently uh, uh, see, um, they also have very different bioavailabilities and pre present different risks if they were to be ingested by people uh, who are recreating on these tailings. If you put some of these tailings actually under uh, the microscope and look at them, for example, in an electron microprobe, this is what's shown on the right-hand side. So this is uh, just a backscattered image of an arsenopyrite grain in the center, but you'll see there's another rim of a second uh, arsenic bearing phase that's growing around that arsenopyrite. So in the center, you have sulfur, you have arsenic, and you have iron. That's the arsenopyrite in the center. But then this rim is actually composed of calcium arsenic and iron, a little bit of iron as well. So this is uh, arsenic and calcium bearing rim on that arsenopyrite, which has a very different sort of solubility and, and uh, environmental characteristics relative to the arsenopyrite. So that's the solids and just a quick couple of quick plots to give you an idea in the waters what you expect to see in these historical districts. This plot here shows total arsenic concentrations on, on the y-axis and the filtered samples, plotted versus unfiltered samples down here on the, on the x-axis. And so if everything plots on this, this diagonal line in the middle of the plot, that means everything is, is mostly dissolved in those waters. So most of it, uh, most of the arsenic in this case occurs uh, as, as um, either dissolved in the in the sample or on particulates that are less than 0.45 microns. And in a nutshell, what I just wanted to demonstrate here was that arsenic concentrations in some of these waters uh, can be very, very high. They can get up, you know, above 1,000 to almost uh, 10,000 part per billion in areas where the water is relatively stagnant. And it's actually quite common in these tailings areas to see waters uh, throughout various seasons running with hundreds of parts per billion uh, arsenic in the water. And so these are close to the, the current metal mining effluent regulations for arsenic from metal mines of 500 micrograms per, or milligrams, micrograms per liter. Uh, and that limit is decreasing to 100 micrograms per liter uh, in June 2021, which, which has implications for future gold mining here in the province. So mercury, on the other hand, displays quite different behavior. Um, mercury originally, of course, in these districts was added in the form of elemental or liquid mercury, uh, which is 
comparatively relatively insoluble in water. And we do see a little bit uh, get into some waters and, and especially associated with particulates in those waters that exceed this uh, aquatic life guideline for mercury. Um, but most of the dissolved concentrations, the total concentrations of, of mercury are comparatively low. Uh, however, they're still high enough that uh, in the right environment under the right conditions and particularly in wetlands and other sorts of conditions where you get uh, uh, suboxic conditions and reducing conditions that are optimal for sulfate re reducing bacteria, you can generate uh, a fair amount of methyl mercury which has real implications for the bioavailability of the mercury in these tailings. So that was really sort of the focus of some of our first work on these tailings, going back all the way to sort of 2003 to 2004 and five. But one of the things we quickly discovered during these early studies was just visiting these various districts, we realized that a lot of people were active on these gold mine sites. And so uh, while we were doing our field work and going around collecting our samples, we saw a lot of what you see here. So this is, this is a photo, these are photographs that were taken in the Montague Gold Mines District, just on the outskirts of Dartmouth here, close to Halifax. And uh, so here you have a large tailings deposit. Uh, the area shown in red is where there's a, sort of an extensive hard pan uh, that has ex especially high concentrations of arsenic, all the way up to four weight percent arsenic. These, these concentrations shown on this graph on the, on, or this plot on the uh, left-hand side are all in parts per million. But what you also have, unfortunately, are all sorts of kids and adults that love to go out and race around in this area on their dirt bikes. And so you have direct exposure. And in this case, we actually went out, you'll see this is a study with Heather and one of her students, Madeline Corbo, back in 2004 and five, where we collected airborne particulates using a high volume air sampler to try and get an idea of what was being kicked up during these activities. And Adjacent to the tailings, you also have all sorts of housing right here, in this case along Montague Mines Road, and then just on, you know, there's other houses within uh, a kilometer of the mine tailings. So you have jumps in the tailings that are used for dirt bikes and ATVs, but what you also have is on very windy days, this is a dusty, dusty site. And so a lot of the tailings are sort of fine silt to sand size material that's easily kicked up by the wind when things dry out in the summer. So you get these dust clouds uh, that will blow up uh, off of the tailings area uh, out over some of the properties that are located in the downwind direction. So that's Montague. The other place where we observed uh, uh, some a fair amount of direct exposure was Goldenville. Again, I mentioned this was the largest district in the province. Um, these were photographs that I took during what was called the Goldenville 4x4 rally that used to take place every Labor Day weekend on the tailings at Goldenville. And um, I first saw a sign advertising this event in 2003. Subsequently, I visited the site again in 2004 where we actually collected particulate during the event. And again, arsenic concentrations, this area shown in red here is where there's a fair amount of hard pan. Arsenic concentrations are particularly high. There's an area close up here to the former Stamp Mill Foundation where they dumped pure arsenopyrite concentrate that has uh, arsenic uh, all the way up to about 20 weight percent or 200 and, uh, roughly 200,000 part per million arsenic. And unfortunately, I, I went up there to take pictures uh, uh, with our student Madeline of the event and us collecting particulates, but quickly realized that there was another story we hadn't anticipated there. And this was all these kids that were there with their parents to witness this event. And so you see one of the events where they're actually drag racing here on the tailings, uh, lots of spectators around, they're selling hot dogs and pizza over here uh, during the event, but there's kids sliding right on tailings other very young children building sand castles uh, out of the tailings during the event. And um, a few more pictures of the same thing. This is actually a, a, a separate day when it was, when it was a bit wet, uh, where you can see people uh, lining up to try and climb a waste rock pile that had been covered in tailings, but lots of kids around. Here, uh, there's somebody sitting there actually eating pop and french fries on formerly uh, sort of former 
concentrate that contains about 20 weight percent arsenic. And here, kids again, little guy eating his hot dog here beside the the raceway. So, unfortunately, um, you know there was no signs warning people that these were mine waste. You know, most people just called the sands. Uh, a few of the locals knew that this was an old mining district, but you know most people were were really sort of taking an unassumed risk here and, and really were not all that familiar with what this material actually was. So, so we. The, the final thing uh, uh, that sort of really took our studies in a different direction was during our studies at the upper and lower seal harbor districts on the eastern shore um, here's a couple of black and white pictures of some very very large stamp mills uh, this is the boston richardson uh, stamp mill and down in lower seal harbor a very large cyanide plant that operated you know in the early 1900s there's a very large area here called Gold Brook and then another uh, brook called West Brook, which were full of tailings from historical operations. Just for reference, for those of you who are familiar with the area, this is the Gold Brook gas plant where the Sable gas project used to actually pump gas on shore here uh, near Isaacs Harbor. That has nothing to do with the gold mines, but just for, for geographic reference. And a lot of these historical tailings had actually, it turned out, made their way all the way to the ocean. And so way back in 2004, I was working with two former provincial employees, Terry Goodwin and Paul Smith. We were eating our lunch actually down here beside Seal Harbor after having worked up at the Lower Seal Harbor mine for the day. And actually we're sitting on this bridge down here uh, on the lower left uh, and watching the woman uh, out in this area uh, digging clams in this intertidal sort of mud flat. And it's funny, it's one of these things, of course, as geologists, we have these strange conversations while we're eating our lunches. And we, we said, you know, it's a really weird place for a mudflat because there's just not that many sort of fine sediment sources in the area. Otherwise, it's a fairly rocky coastline uh, along, that, along that area. And um, after lunch, you know, I got up and just started digging around. And we quickly realized uh, that actually this entire area was, was actually an intertidal tailings flat that was previously unrecognized. And we bushwhacked up this stream after lunch and came out at the mine site. So uh, I called some folks that I knew with Environment Canada here in Dartmouth, uh, especially a fellow named Ken Doe, who retired a few years back and said, Ken, I've got a really interesting place for you guys to go collect some clams if you're interested. And they went out uh, and uh, uh, analyzed, actually they collected a bunch of clams from that area and got the results over the next couple months and realized quickly that uh, some of the concentrations of arsenic in these clams were all the way up to about 2,300 part per, part per million uh, dry weight arsenic in the clams. They were the highest uh, value was ever reported for soft shell clams of this nature. And here's some controls just from a grocery store up in Moncton that they had purchased just to kind of give an idea of what the background concentrations were like. But really the only, criteria they could find even compare these numbers to was a, was a national guideline for fish protein of about three and a half part per million arsenic. And so clearly these were numbers were much, much higher. So we found ourselves in this position in early 2005 where, you know, we, we realized that, you know, these tailings had quite high arsenic concentrations that were well in excess of any sort of soil quality guidelines. Um, and you know, at, at some historical mines, we, we knew people were exposed to these materials through recreational activities, there was lots of dust, and uh, potentially via contaminated fish and shellfish. So, you know, knowing that we're a bunch of geologists and really not, uh, you know, specialists in, in any sort of risk management, um, we felt we needed to share these results with somebody that might have a better sense of whether or not this really uh, is an issue that needs to be managed. And so, I was invited to go and talk to uh, a variety of uh, deputy ministers with the province uh, in spring 2005. And to their credit, they acted very quickly, actually. Uh, the people that know a lot about these sorts of things uh, rapidly decided that yes, uh, the province definitely needed to do something about this. Uh, many of the historic mine sites were actually located on provincially managed crown land and so they formed this historical mines advisory committee in 2005 and this consisted of five federal departments as well as five provincial departments uh, we divided ourselves into sort of a variety of different working groups because quickly realized that there was a lot 
of questions that remained unanswered about where the tailings were and what sort of true health risks existed. And this uh, group was active for roughly about four years and prevent, uh, basically had a direct line through senior managers right up to Nova Scotia cabinet. So uh, to the province's credit, they acted very quickly in the early days and, and actually released a website, which is still accessible at Nova Scotia Environment that discusses some of the key issues with respect to historic gold mine tailings. Um, you know, these are again, things that happened uh, during a time when there were no environmental regulations. And so they quickly got information out to the public. They had um, a big um, sort of uh, a media event that they held in, in May, 2005 and issued two separate media releases that year. Uh, this is the first one in June, 2005 saying Nova Scotians were advised to avoid gold tailings. Uh, subsequent to that, we did more research and they actually asked people to stay off the tailings entirely at both Montague and Goldenville. And uh, Fisheries and Oceans also rapidly uh, moved to issue a, a shellfish advisory, closing down uh, Seal Harbor to bivalve shellfish harvesting. Uh, and that closure remains in place to this day. Um, you know, that, that's an area, fortunately, there was no commercial production from there, but it was something where it was a, a fairly commonly used place by local residents. So the earliest sort of risk management actions that took place at Montague and Goldenville really consisted of putting signs up in the trees to at least let people know that the tailings in these areas, uh, you know, they just said soils on this site contain arsenic, uh, keep off this site at the request of the medical officer health. Those signs went up in March, 2006. But as you can see in the upper right, uh, you know, this quickly became a pretty interesting experiment in, in uh, risk perception and public perception of what these what the true risks at these sites actually were um I, I feel it's worth pointing out as well that even when i presented some of this research in the early days uh some people too took this very seriously and said you know this is definitely something we need to do there was other people uh that felt that maybe this was all a little overblown and that actually people of course were much more likely to probably break their arm on their dirt bike or, or their ATV or somehow injure themselves otherwise. And it was quickly pointed out uh, by actually a national health risk assessor that the big difference there of course was that somebody out on their dirt bike knows that they might break their arm. Uh, the parents of those children at Goldenville really had no idea of the risks the potential risks that they're exposing their kids to. And so it's really, uh, in, you know, a contingent, uh, you know, it's imperative that somebody uh, try and actually at least warn people and, and subsequently manage these risks. So that really took our research in an entirely different direction. And so, so the last sort of major section of the research was really about looking at and trying to reduce the risks at these sites. And so we brought in new partners at this point and this is a, this is where I started really getting outside of my own comfort zone as a, as a geoscientist but this diagram really shows you know what happens let's say if one of those kids was to ingest a soil particle here on the upper left so pretend that's arsenic showing in orange that's attached to some soil particle and you accidentally get some of that into your stomach whatever comes off in your stomach and actually ends up, you know, out in your gastrointestinal tract, that's what we call bioaccessible. So that's actually, it's in your gastrointestinal tract and, you know, it might come off also in your small intestine, but ultimately it's this stuff here, uh, the stuff that's actually absorbed to your blood that's termed bioavailable. And that's really where most of the risk comes from. Anything that gets, that doesn't make it in there, of course, is probably, you know, goes out in your feces, your urine and really doesn't resist uh, represent a problem, but this particularly soluble component is what we were kind of trying to wrap our heads around. What controlled that potential risk? And so what we did was we went out to these districts and we collected uh, a whole bunch of tailings and soil samples from the surface where people might be exposed. Uh, we did a bunch of very detailed chemical and mineralogical analysis with, uh, with Queen's University, the Royal Military College, and other partners, and then ultimately sub subjected these things to bioaccessibility extractions. And so this is a neat method that's still commonly used for risk assessment today, where uh, this is just one example of what's called a physiologically based extraction test, where we simulated in the lab the gastric phase uh, where you actually simulate uh, uh, conditions in your stomach. 
and then subsequently what happens in your intestines. So this is a type effectively of a sequential extraction and then basically analyze what came off in these various steps. And so I'm not going to go into the details here, but that work has been well published and I'd be happy to share that with anybody that's interested. And it really kind of helped to us to prioritize which tailings were more of a risk than others. We also did a lot of background soil sampling. This was work that I published actually in Atlantic Geology in 2015, really to understand uh, what the concentrations were uh, in the very near surface materials. So the top sort of zero to five centimeters of soil, that's called the public health layer by Health Canada, uh, as well as some deeper uh, zones, horizons in the soil to get an idea of how much arsenic and mercury uh, are naturally occurring in these districts and what the background concentrations really look like. So this involved, you know, this is just a typical soil profile that you would see uh, in the Montague and Goldenville districts where you have sort of deep till that's been weathered to B horizon soil, some leached AE horizons, and then you get sort of humus and other material on the surface. And we plotted up all that uh, information and what you can see here is just one of many different examples we have where here's the tailings at Montague showing in light gray and then the dots this is a proportional dot size map so the bigger the dot the higher the arsenic concentration and what you basically get is a halo of high arsenic levels where this dust is blowing and has blown for decades around the tailings. Um, the other really important thing to point out, and especially given that this is AGS and there's people that know a lot more ex about exploration and probably ore deposit geology than I do, is that all of these little squares here in the diagram are actually former mine shafts. So these are where the quartz veins are located and the ice direction. So when this, this district was glaciated, the ice transport direction was basically from up here, from north to south, or basically sort of northwest to southeast. And what you can see, if you look carefully, is that you see considerably lower concentrations of arsenic in the public health layer north of the district, so up ice of the ore zone and down ice, and well, as one might expect, you see much higher concentrations. This is not a human effect. This is basically due to glacial transport of arsenic, and one needs to consider this. Uh, when you're looking at uh, the variability of arsenic in these materials. So the final bit of research was actually trying to figure out how would you actually clean up these places. And so we did a lot of uh, studies again with various partners, including a couple of different consulting firms uh, on optimizing remediation methods for the tailings. And the reason this was really important was that uh, they're just one of the challenges with these tailings is that they're not like modern gold mine tailings where you get sort of unoxidized sulfides, uh, you know, that are, are fairly homogeneous and easy to manage. Um, we had evidence of what might happen if you just basically dumped a bunch of dirt on top of the tailings and flattened them out. This is what happened, for example, at the historical Cochrane Hill gold mine that was operated briefly during the 1980s, where when we first studied this place, they had actually even buried cyanide drums uh, in the tailings here, spent sodium cyanide solution. Uh, the tailings were kind of just left in, in this, this state for years and years. Uh, lots of mess in the old mill structure. And then what happened was a company came in and actually bulldozed this that was exploring the area in uh, sort of 2004 and five, and then hydra seeded the entire area, uh, which may work okay if, if the tailings themselves are not particularly well oxidized. Uh, but the big problem that we see, and as you saw in some of those previous plots, is if you look at a district like Montague or Goldenville, you get a lot of this hard pan material where you've got these very, very oxidized, very high arsenic uh, phases that are hosting the arsenic. This is no longer arsenopyrite, but it's a wide range of different secondary minerals like scoridite. And that material is stable in contact with, with oxygen and water and bacteria at the surface. And it doesn't like to be covered in soil. And that, you know, our concern was potentially if you dumped soil directly on this material without doing anything to it, that you could potentially destabilize these weathering related arsenic minerals and then turn your dust problem inadvertently into a water quality problem. And so that's really what we had summarized to the province is that, you know, we knew these tailings were heterogeneous, these old tailings, it's not like dealing with modern gold mine tailings. Uh, you get various minerals like arsenopyrite that's stable under reducing conditions, but then other things like scoridite that really like these acidic oxidizing environments. 
In addition, unlike a modern talons impoundment, you have streams that cross cut the talons at both sites. The talons are unimpounded. There's lots of venues to transport this arsenic off site. And then the final one was, of course, as you've seen, these are frequented by off road vehicles. And the remediation decisions also really need to consider the likelihood of human interaction and, and to some extent, the community's desire to access these sites. So, we subsequently, the final bit of research that we did on this was really looking in detail at what processes controlled arsenic cycling in the tailings. Uh, some of our partners at Queens and the, and the uh, geoengineering department there actually uh, tested various types of geosynthetic clay liners. We had very detailed column tests in the lab, all sorts of very high tech uh, microenvironment chambers, in this case, at Trent University, trying to simulate the weathering conditions in these tailings to optimize some sort of remediation strategy. I also uh, came up with a very low-tech uh, uh, experiment at GSC Atlantic where we, where we actually collected four different types of tailings from one of these areas, put them in a bunch of garbage cans out in the backyard, and then actually let rainwater leach down through these and collected uh, water every time it rained for, four, for actually for two a year period. And one of the key messages we learned from this was that some of the types of tailings that had very high calcium uh, actually were pH neutral through that entire period. So over a two year period, these tailings really remained somewhere between pH seven and eight. The water draining out really wasn't that bad. Still fairly high arsenic, but, but not acidic. But then what happened was that the tailings out of the wetlands in these areas started out close to neutral. So the poor water, these pH, uh, the poor water pH was maybe about six or seven. But what happened right over the first season was that these quickly became acidic and we discovered that there was enough remnant uh, uh, sulfides in these wetland tailings. So things also that have formed like framboidal pyrite that they will actually oxidize quite quickly and the pH went from six to seven all the way down to about three. And so you had some types of tailings that were very acidic or they released very acidic leachate. And so this was a bit of a wake up call for us, even though we did not measure a whole lot of acidity in general in the field, uh, the tailings certainly still had enough potential to generate acidity under the right conditions. So the practical aspects, I'm getting to the last part of the talk here now, is just how do we use this today? Um, so one of the recommendations that we've, we've sort of uh, tried to communicate was that in general if you have an area with tailings that are sitting in wetlands that these should just sort of be left alone unless they really really need to be moved so um, we know that if you expose these things to oxidizing conditions the tailings can produce acidic very metal rich drainage. And so uh, modern mining companies, including prospectors, been a lot of people, of course, who've looked at the possibility of reprocessing historical tailings in the past, but it needs to be done very carefully, if at all, uh, unless you have an approved plan to mitigate those risks, because there is a high risk in some cases, you could end up with, uh, with oxidizing tailings. And really these days with modern environmental regulations, you just can't put the stuff back where you found it. Um, we know that some of the hard pans uh, produce very acidic drainage. And uh, if you're going to try and remediate that material, you either have to excavate it or uh, potentially cover it with a shallow uh, soil cover, ideally with some sort of hydraulic barrier like a geosynthetic clay line or a GCL that avoids transporting the contaminants elsewhere. So these practical sort of guidelines, we communicated to these through the province way back in 2012. And more recently, uh, just in September 2018, uh, I got a call actually from somebody that we worked with with the province before uh, to give me a heads up that the province actually had just issued a request for closure concepts and costs for the Montague and Goldenville site. So, you know, it, it's cleaning up sites like this is, is a challenging endeavor at best. And of course, you're dealing with legacy issues on provincia, provincially owned land. And so what had happened was actually the Auditor General in the province had, had questioned the province about uh, whether or not we had a really good handle on the liabilities associated with some of these, these abandoned uh, contaminated sites. And so the province committed to spending up to about $48 million to clean up 
two former gold mine sites. And because we had worked with uh, a whole wide variety of people on this committee, we had prioritized all 64 of the districts and they were able to dust off some of this previous work that had been done at Goldenville and Montague and have subsequently uh, hired consultants who have developed a remediation plan that will involve excavating some of the most contaminated material up to a depth of two meters, putting them in line containment cells, and then using various types of covers to actually cover the tailings in these two districts. Uh, as a part of that, what happened was that once people started having a closer look at the Montague district, um, late last summer, uh, it was also recognized that the tailings didn't just end at Montague at the mine site. And, so, and, and historically, we knew, and it was subsequently proven with some sampling, that uh, the stream downstream of Montague, between there and what's called Lake Charles here in Dartmouth, uh, there's a stream area called Berry's Run. And so the tailings subsequently, uh, back in, you know, the, from the 1860s to the late 1930s, had traveled down through this stream and entered the lake. And so this whole stream area actually has some level of historical mine tailings. Unfortunately, a developer, um, you know, has, with the best of intention, had, had this uh, a wonderful proposal for a brand new subdivision in this area called the Port Wallace Development. And uh, subsequently discovered that this stream running right down through the middle of the development uh, contained all sorts of um, high arsenic gold mine tailings. And so now the, this, that this project has uh, been delayed somewhat and actually the city if issued an advisory while they studied this, this topic further. And it's clear that uh, if this development does proceed, that they're going to have to be very, very careful with stormwater management and exposure barriers uh, during any future development. So just one example of, you know, the, the, the sorts of headaches that unfortunately these historical activities can have decades and decades later. So the last couple slides I have here for you this afternoon, uh, just before I wrap up, take some questions. Um, I, I wanted to talk about how, what, what, what does this research mean for current and modern gold mining here in Nova Scotia and elsewhere? Um, I'm sure many of you, and certainly those of you living in Nova Scotia, have likely seen uh, quite a bit of the debate that has emerged in the media over the last two years, uh, where you know there's there's sort of even these competing forces where uh, many people that uh, you know companies, for example, that that would like to uh, develop further gold mines in the province, uh, including Atlantic Gold, that currently has an operating mine up at Moose River, um, you know, are really doing all sorts of, of exploration and there's all sorts of great potential out there and then you know you have other people that are very concerned about what this means for the environment and you know there's there's uh, been a lot of confusion sometimes deliberate uh, to try and basically say hey look at all these terrible environmental things that happened in the past we don't want any more mining in Nova Scotia they made a mess of this in the past and it's all the same and we don't want any of that. And so various organizations, including the Mining Association in Nova Scotia have been trying to get the word out that these new mines today are not the mines of yesterday. And so what I wanted to do on, on this slide was just really sort of highlight some of the similarities and differences between these two different types of mines. So on the left, what I've done is this is just a picture of Goldenville from 1897. You can see there's waste rock and some shafts here. And, the mining method historically, you know, was mostly underground shafts. Again, very little open pit mining, but this photo on the upper right, this is a photo from Moose River in 2018. That is an open pit mine operation. And so it's a much larger scale, uh, very different operation where you've got uh, blasting and, and like all sorts of very large haul trucks and that, that are moving a very large amount of material around, quite different than the historical operations. Uh, so you get small volumes of waste rock, typically with most of the historical districts, but large volumes uh, in some of the, the more recent operations. The milling techniques, of course, are quite different. Uh, historically, there was a lot of mercury used and, and cyanide uh, subsequent uh, after the 1890s. These days, it's mostly ball milling, uh, gravity separation, as well as cyanidation, but no mercury used in the current mining operations. The legacy sites, of course, tailings were unconfined. They were just discharged into the lake streams, the ocean, and the environment directly with no treatment whatsoever. Whereas these days, that is definitely not allowed. You actually 
uh, mo modern mining companies are required to store those uh, tailings underwater uh, or in some sort of impoundment or open pit so that they don't move out into the environment. And the effluent, historically, there was no treatment, just direct discharge into the environment, whereas these days um, there's plenty of treatment to remove cyanide, arsenic, iron, and other elements. So the the last couple of pictures here are just sort of to give you an idea of you know the scope of some of these operations and so you know from the air if you look at uh google earth or whatever you'd be hard pressed in some cases to actually identify some of these historical districts but uh, in moose river this was a like just to give you an idea what moose river uh and this is sort of just up and in, in, uh, it's about 60 minutes outside of halifax uh, look like in June 2012, the exact same image in June uh, 2019 is this. So um, this just gives you an idea. This is the open pit over here on the left. Here's the mill site up here uh, in the north part of the, uh, the, the site. This is a big waste rock pile over here. This is the tailings uh, impoundment right here. So there's a kilometer for scale on the lower left. And then there's an effluent treatment plant some what are called geotubes uh, that are used to actually remove arsenic and iron and other elements from the effluent. They discharge the water from this tailings eventually once it's treated into what's called a polishing pond. And subsequently that water is released through a constructed wetland down here in the lower part and then goes directly into what's called scraggy lake. So that is their discharge point right there into the environment. And they are heavily monitored uh, on a routine basis based on the, the discharge directly out into the environment from that point. So again, that's, that's 2019 and for reference 2012. So just give you an idea of the, you know, how quickly things can change in some of these areas. So this is what the open pit looks like in December, 2018. I had the opportunity to tour that site with a bunch of federal and provincial regulators. They have a very modern processing plant that uses cyanide leach tanks to remove the, uh, the gold from the ore and ultimately uh, it's absorbed onto carbon, what's called a carbon and leach circuit. The tailings are discharged into this tailings impoundment and these big black bags on the lower right here are the geotubes where they actually discharge their treated effluent. In there they collect all the particulates, all the suspended material in those bags and ultimately either transport that off site or bury those in an area that's lined on the site. So the key messages, this is really the last slide, in the, in the gold fields of Nova Scotia, the best place to find a new mine, you know, this is, this is sort of a, a famous line that you see applied to a lot of historical districts. The best place to find a new gold mine in Nova Scotia is in the shadow of an old mine. Uh, there's the very few areas in Nova Scotia, there are a few, but there's relatively few uh, that, that are not in a former mining districts. And so unfortunately, this means that modern miners and companies uh, they have to really have plans to deal with legacy mine waste like historical tailings that have both high arsenic as well as high mercury concentrations. Um, we know that mining really rapidly you know, increases the surface area of these mine waste. It rapidly accelerates these weathering reactions and the, uh, the release of metalloids. And that mine drainage and tailings effluent can be expected to be circumneutral with high arsenic concentrations. Um, there is a possibility of reprocessing some of these historical wastes to recover some of their gold content, but there's really key questions that remain concerning the economics uh, and how you do this best, uh, as well as regulatory and policy barriers. And then finally, you know, there are some key knowledge gaps, uh, ecological impacts of arsenic and mercury bioaccumulation, and the long-term performance of waste rock, uh, as well as some of these open pits and tailings covers. So I'm glad to say that on the last point, you know, there are some, there's some really good research that's underway, and I wanted to throw a quick uh, advertisement out for Dr. Linda Campbell's research group at St. Mary's University here in Halifax. She's done a really wonderful job since 2014, she and her students, of actually understanding some of the ecosystem risks associated with historical tailings. Uh, we actually just published this paper on the lower right in Environmental Reviews. It just came out actually in the last uh, few months uh, to really review everything that's, that's been published on these ecosystem impacts, which unfortunately have sort of taken a bit of a back burner uh, backseat to the human health risks in these districts uh, once those were recognized. Uh, 
And my colleague, Terry Chang, who I think is actually also on the call here, that's his picture in the center in the bottom of the, the photograph, is that a very interesting project where he's actually been reprocessing some of these historical tailings under NRCAN's Mining Value from Waste Initiative. And the goal here really is to take these high arsenic and mercury tailings to reduce the content of arsenic and mercury, the, the, the median gold grade in a lot of these tailings is about 0.37 grams per ton. And ideally, if you could recover that, produce benign tailings, maybe that, that material could even be used for construction applications. And so you essentially turn this waste into a resource. That's the ideal case scenario. And there's more work required to, to see that as a reality. So. Um, I just wanted to wrap up by, again, thanking all of you for being here. Uh, these are a few of our key collaborators uh, that have participated in these studies over the years, in particular, Heather Jamison and Carrie Rowe and various students from Queens, uh, collaborators from the Royal Military College, as well as St. Mary's. Uh, the province has been a huge support from day one uh, with this research, and we've been able to fund this both through in-house uh, as well as external funding through organizations like INSERC and, and Health Canada as well. So um, we've published a lot of this. I'm happy to share some of these resources uh, with anybody that's interested. I've got a running bibliography that's still on the go, and I'll leave it there for this afternoon. Thank you very much.